I'm Rick Halsey. I'm with the Chaparral Institute, and it's an organization that just loves nature, which is what we're going to do here today, show you how to love nature. So right around us is a meadow, and we're going to start this video off today with a talk about habitats. Habitats are places where certain plants and animals live that are very distinct. For example, right behind us is the meadow. There's three basic kinds of habitats. There's meadows and grasslands. There's shrublands, which is basically full of shrubs, and then there's forests, which have a lot of trees. And most people don't know those distinctions, so let's take a look and explore each one of these. So the question is, why is there grass here and no shrubs and no trees? So think about that for a minute. You got an answer yet? Well, I'll give it to you, just, just in case you haven't come up with one. So a lot of grasslands have very clay-like soils. It's very fine, and there just isn't enough material here for plants like shrubs and trees to really get a foothold. So basically what you've got are these very shallow-rooted grasses and small, what we call herbaceous plants, that kind of dominate. And so they keep all the shrubs and the trees away and occasionally, sometimes, you'll see a meadow like this or a grassland filled with native species. In other words, the ones that have been here forever. But unfortunately, most grasslands now and most meadows are filled with non-native plants. And those are ones that have uh, been found in various places of the world, like the Mediterranean area, like in Italy and North Africa. And they've come here and they've invaded our landscapes because basically they're ad adapted to disturbance. And what that means is there used to be cattle here on the Daly Ranch and they tromped around a lot and they disturbed the ground. And along with them, they brought probably some weed seeds, some non-native weed seeds. And so these plants love disturbed soils. And once they get a foothold, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. But there are still some native plants here that are trying to eke out an existence. Let's take a look at a few. This is ragweed. And you've heard people maybe talk about ragweed before. They kind of... <coughs> Sneeze, raggy weed, I don't know. Anyway, so <laughs> this plant's interesting because it's in the sunflower family and you don't see any sunflowers on it. That's because it has a very specialized form of flower type. And if you look at the top of this flower, these are the male flowers. So the male and female flowers are separated. Males are at the top of the plant and the females are very, very tiny down below in the central part of the stems. Inside of these little packets are the pollen grains. You can't really see them, but they're in there. And when the wind blows them, which is typically how these flowers spread their pollen, not by bees, but by, by wind, they'll filter down below, and the female flowers are down below on the stems here, and they get pollinated and produce the seeds. Here's another member of the sunflower family. It doesn't look like much of a sunflower at all. It's uh, called horseweed. <laughs> and uh, that was a sound effect. Uh, they don't actually make that noise. Anyway, the, uh, the flowers, unlike the ragweed, they have the female and male parts in each flower. But if you take a look at the little tops, you can see they're kind of floofy at the top. Those are the little like wings that the plants produced to cause the seeds to fly in the wind. So you're saying this is a flower? And that question is actually a great question because no, it's not a flower. This is actually a bouquet of separate flowers. There's dozens of little flowers in there, each one producing its own little seed. We're filming this in the fall, so it's very dry and, and, and flat. If this was spring, of course, it would be green. But this is actually a perfect time to be out here because the seeds that these non-native weeds and grasses grow are pretty irritating. They get stuck in your socks and your dog's ears and your dog's paws. And you can take a look at some of the remains of these seed areas, like at the tips here, and they go up high like this. So when an animal brushes by or, or your socks, <laughs> it grabs in. And those are the things that cause us a lot of problems, which actually is the reason why these are so widespread because these seeds have been designed over millions of years to be able to get distributed by animals and they go where they want to go. And as a result, this entire meadow now is filled with non-native 
grasses and weeds where it used to be native grasses. Here's another native plant that you find in grasslands. This is telegraph weed and the flowers are all gone now but the remains are there meaning the seeds and they're just waiting to get just a little bit riper before they fall off with the wind and you can see what happens. <laughs> they just distribute themselves all over the place. And this is why sunflowers are very successful because they produce a lot of seeds. And I was going to say per flower, but this is not a flower. This is a bouquet. So lots of seeds per plant and they spread often by wind. Here's a fun native plant that's in the grassland. This is called uh, golden bush, a couple other common names for it. And if you take a look at the flower clusters, you probably know based on our comments about ragweed and, and horseweed, this is in the sunflower family. And as with all sunflowers, if you squeeze one of the little flower heads, little baby flowers come right out of the top. So every one of those produces its own seed. We found a California native grass. Let's go see it. Here we have a whole family of deer grass and you'll look at it and you'll see, well, this is, <laughs> this is quite different than the non-native grass we saw in the bigger meadow. These are big humps and these grasses live for 10, 20, 30, 40, probably even a century long uh, in terms of years because they just keep growing. One of the interesting things about this plant in terms of Native American culture is they would use these little stemmy type things here for their baskets. So this is very special. It doesn't appear everywhere. It needs a little more water than the typical non-native grass, so it's pretty restricted in its, in its uh, distribution or, or where you find it. But you can see it's having a pretty good time, and oftentimes what'll happen is if a fire burns here, it'll burn it all the way down to the ground, and it'll just re-sprout again. So this will just keep growing and growing and growing, and it's a beautiful little display of a native a native habitat. So if you wanted to sort of imagine a native grassland, just take this and expand it by 10 times. And there's your native grassland with grasses that live for years and years and they don't die every year like the non-natives typically that are annuals. So here we have a twiggy wreath plant. It's a funny little name for a funny little plant. And if you look at the flowers, they're just staggered along the stems here, but they have something that I've been wanting to see during this shoot, and it's petal-like structures right here that look like an actual flower. But let's take a closer look, because these actually aren't petals, because it's in the sunflower family, and sunflowers don't have petals, they just have flowers. So this particular sunflower, instead of having a a little head of little yellow pointy things or whatever. It actually has these little projections and most people are going to call these petals, but they're not. Each one of these is a separate ray flower and inside are the little spiky kinds of flowers called disc flowers. So this is a bouquet of two kinds of sunflower flowers. There's ray flowers and disc flowers, but they all do the same thing when they get pollinated is to create that little poofy kind of fluff. And let's see if we can find one. Here's the end product with the floofies, and you can see they all fall off with the wind or a menacing finger, characteristic of the sunflower family. We're now leaving the grassland. We're going to our second habitat up on these hills here, chaparral. One P, two R's. Everybody misspells it. I don't know why, but it's a beautiful habitat that most people don't recognize at all because most people see forests maybe and maybe grasslands, but the stuff in between, the chaparral, is often ignored and misunderstood. But up in there are some beautiful things. That particular mountain is covered actually with ceanothus, one of the keystone shrub species in the chaparral. And the greener shrubs right below are laurel sumac. That's one of the other characteristic shrubs of the chaparral. So let's take a closer look. Right next to the chaparral, oftentimes you have a different kind of shrubland, 
This is sage scrub, California sage scrub. And it's dominated by plants that are pretty fragile. If you walk through them, they snap and break. Uh, the difference between this kind of shrubland, the sage scrub shrubland, and the chaparral shrubland is that if you try to walk through chaparral, you come back bleeding. If you walk through sage scrub, you come back smelling like an after dinner mint. <laughs> so you can actually walk through this stuff. So it gets a little confusing because shrublands are a whole group of habitats. But in general, it's one type of system that's dominated by shrubs. As grasslands, there's different kinds of grasslands, but we have some native grassland components here and some non-native grasslands. And then when we look at forests, there's a whole bunch of kinds of forests, of course. We're going to look at some oak forests here at Daly Ranch. But this represents the coastal sage scrub or California sage scrub component of the shrubland ecosystem in Daly Ranch. A good way to explore nature and really sense it is through your nose. And in sage scrub environments, it's a perfect place. This particular plant is called white sage. It's one of the many sages here. There's white sage, black sage. There's a plant that's called uh, California sagebrush. It's not actually a sage. It's, a, it's in the sunflower family, but uh, it still smells wonderful. So you take these leaves and you kind of break them up a little bit and you run them across your nose. Oh, it's wonderful. And a fun little trick to play is to collect several of these different species that have different smells and ask your friends, which one is this one? And that's how you can identify these plants is by their smell. Native Americans use the white sage a lot for ceremonial purposes by burning because it creates a tremendous aromatic fragrance. It's really quite beautiful. So sage scrub, the best way to enjoy it by smelling it. Here's another classic chaparral shrub. This is manzanita. This particular one is called Mission Manzanita. It has these really large little berries and the seeds that are embedded in these things are just behind almost a fortress of wood. So it's really hard to get to the seeds and they germinate on the ground during the rainy season. And the trick is these plant babies have to survive the summer without any water and most of them don't do it. In fact, it took me a long time to ever find a seedling of the Mission Manzanita and we thought that that's probably one of the reasons why these are becoming increasingly rare is because they are probably used to a time when there was a little more summer rain which we don't get in Chaparral in Southern California. So the seedlings have to survive a long drought to get through the end to be able to continue to grow. So most of the seedlings of the Mission Manzanita, they don't make it. If you wanted to find one particular plant that is always in the chaparral, this would probably be it. This is chemise. It's a beautiful plant. It's got tiny little leaves. These little flower clusters are beautifully uh, highlighted in creamy kind of white colors in the blooming season. It has very, very tiny leaves for a specific purpose. It doesn't lose a lot of water. So this is chemise. It's got a fun little scientific name, Adenostoma fasciculatum. And scientific names are really kind of interesting because they help you identify the plant, whereas common names sometimes change from location. Uh, its relative, Adenostoma sparsifolia, is a, a, sort of a related species of this, but as the name sounds, sparsifolia, it's less dense, it's sparser. So scientific names sound kind of funny, um, but they actually have a real significant reason to uh, use because they're standard, they, they apply no matter where you are, and they're mostly from Latin and Greek. And so if you ever take a Latin class or Greek class, surprisingly, you know a lot of different languages because a lot of languages in the world are related to uh, classic Latin and Greek. And then you can speak plant. One of my favorite parts of the chaparral habitat are the secret chaparral tunnels, often made of sea notice or manzanita shrubs. This particular one behind us that we're about to go into is made out of sea anothus shrubs, 10 feet high. Let's go take a look. These things just arch over my head and they create this really cool place to hike. One of the really special things about these chaparral tunnels is this is where the California grizzly bear used to roam. They'd make these tunnels throughout the chaparral. Can you imagine being a Native American, just going along your business and all of a sudden seeing some grizzly bear standing up 10 feet tall? 
they're incredibly dominant animals. They, 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 they ruled Daly Ranch and, and San Diego and California, in fact. The last one was seen in 1920s or so in the sequoias. The last one that was killed in Southern California was in 1908 up in the Tabuco Canyon in the Santa Ana Mountains. So there are no more California grizzlies anymore. They're all extinct. We took care of them pretty quickly after we showed up here, unfortunately. But when I walk through tunnels like this, I, I, I just sometimes, <sighs> I stand quietly and I just imagine what it was like for these bears at, at one point in time. They, they put their paw in the same place generation after generation. And so there'd be trails that'd be kind of like a series of potholes. And I'm convinced today still, there's still grizzly bear trails somewhere in these older stands of chaparral that haven't burned for 150 years or so. And I'm still looking for them. But just, just imagine being in this tunnel and ah! We're in our third habitat type, the forest. And this particular forest is called the oak woodland. And we have acorn woodpeckers up in the canopy. A lot of shade here and a lot more moisture than you find in the chaparral and grasslands. And so as a result, you'll find different animals and different plants here. And it's all about moisture. Grasslands have the least. Chaparral is in the middle, uh, sage scrub, shrublands. And then forest, of course, have more moisture, which is why you have the trees. And in oak woodlands, you often have your riparian or streamland areas too. We're walking through a riparian area, which is just a fancy name for a stream, which is often found in forest habitat. You get a lot of plants that depend a lot on water. For example, one of my favorite riparian plants is the cockleburr. And that's this little plant here. It's got these fun burls on them that have little spikes. And you'll notice what happens if an animal comes by or a person, it sticks right on the shirt. And this is actually the inspiration for Velcro. You know, that stuff that goes back and forth when you seal things up. And they have these little hooks here that are like barbs on Velcro. And so this is, I guess, one of the famous parts of the riparian environment is Velcro. Surprisingly, one of the most interesting things about forests is not necessarily all the living trees, but the dead trees on the ground and the ones that are still standing because they provide habitat for animals and plants that don't exist any other way. So instead of thinking of dead trees as the sort of the end of the cycle, it's the beginning of a brand new cycle. It's a continuum. Trees emerge from the ground, they grow, they provide habitat, then they die and they provide more habitat. And so you have multiple stories going on in the forest and the dead trees are a big part of that. And a lot of folks think, well, that's dead, it's, it's worthless. We need to clear it up and clean it up. Well, that's a human perspective. N nature loves <laughs> any kind of component of a, of a tree's life cycle because it provides new opportunities, new habitats for all sorts of animals, which increases the biodiversity of an entire landscape. So instead of just having a neat little system of trees in a row, for example, and, and, and lawn in between, you've got all this messy nature, which provides so much habitat. Looking at this dead log, you'll see all sorts of lichens that are coming out of the older material. In fact, some of these lichens in some areas in Southern California, we think are almost extinct because a lot of the old material has been burned or cleared out. And this is really important for a lot of species of lichens, for example. This old stuff has gotta be on the ground to support their life cycle. And if you look down below here, we've got little piles of chunks of wood that have dropped out from inside here that provide another source of habitat for a multitude of invertebrates, little worms, little insects. Here's another wonderful lichen. There's kind of light green and dark green. And the thing about lichens, it helps you understand nature in a way that nothing else really can because they're not very distinct. A lot of people don't notice them. But what happens is, is when you are made aware of lichens 
and you look at them, all of a sudden you'll notice there's different kinds. And this is the magic of loving nature, is that when you find out what you know by learning some of the names and identifying some of the creatures, you all of a sudden realize what you don't know. So you'll see some lichens, some light green, dark greenish kind of lichens, and all of a sudden there'll be a red one. And you'll notice it because you notice the other ones. So learning about nature is not so much what you're learning, it's making you aware of what you don't know. And so lichens are a great example of that. I have a friend who's a lichenologist, and in fact, I never really noticed lichens until he took, he took me on a hiking trip that focused just on lichens, and I had no idea. They're everywhere, and they're an essential part of both forest and chaparral environments. And in fact, they are a critical part of the dead wood forest component of the forest because they need this old material, this old wood, as a substrate or a surface to grow. And without the dead wood, you wouldn't have these lichens. So when you come to Daly Ranch, you'll now know there's different habitats. And there's three basic kinds. Grasslands. The shrublands. Forests. And each one of these habitats have sort of complications involved, but for the most part, there's three basic ones. So in grasslands, a lot of those are unfortunately filled with invasive non-native weeds, but there's a lot of native plants out there too. So you just have to go out there and explore and, and see what you're looking for. The second habitat, the shrublands, there's chaparral, there's sage scrub, and there's some other types, but it, Daily Ranch is mostly chaparral and sage scrub. In fact, most of, most of Daily Ranch is chaparral. And then finally you have forest, and there's different kinds of forests, of course. But within forests, you have different forest types. Here we have oak woodlands. In other areas, you may have conifer forests with pine trees. And usually in, in these kinds of environments in Southern California, where there's chaparral and sage scrub and oak woodlands, in oak woodlands, you also have riparian areas or stream beds, which provide a lot of the moisture that the trees need. In fact, you often see little ribbons of riparian areas or streams surrounded by the oak woodland, which is where you find most of these forest type structures in Daly Ranch and other places in Southern California. So thanks for listening. I hope you've had a wonderful time. Get out to Daly Ranch and explore all the habitats in Southern California. Mm -hmm.